Hello. We'll start in a second. Let me just open my presentation. Okay. Uh, no, not yet. Um, here it is. So uh, today uh, we kind of finish up uh, the cohomology part of our lectures in the sense uh, that we uh, cover two more important topics. One is called Ninhurst pencils, and the other is called uh, the other is the second cohomology. You'll see um, there are some some important words. I need first. First, I need to say, well, um, those topics uh, they're quite new. Ninhurst pencils they appear naturally in very many different uh, settings. In recent years, uh, they appear naturally in uh, Poisson pencils, in finite dimensional uh, case. They appear as a Poisson pencils in infinite dimensional case. Uh, we will see uh, those two pencils here. Um, then, uh, uh, so these objects, they do play an important role in geometry, also in pro in um, projective equivalence of metrics. That is the classical uh, differential geometry topic we started with. And uh, uh, the object itself, it is formulated in uh, in terms of Frohlicher and Inhuis bracket, the same as the uh, Poisson pencils are formulated in terms of Skouten brackets. So uh, the second part of lecture is uh, second cohomology. It turns out that in case of um, uh, Nienhuis operator, in case of Nienhuis manifold, you have not one, but actually two different cohomologies. One cohomology we've already discussed, that is the cohomology of frohlicher nienhuis cohomology, we called it. It is similar to the uh, Scouten, uh, to the Lichnerovich poisson cohomology, in the sense that it it is uh, uh, more of, a, of an algebraic nature. The second cohomology we're going to discuss, we call it Nienhuis cohomology, uh, but we do it very carefully because uh, there might be some confusion in terms of literature because different people use different names for the same thing. So I just, in the title, I use the term second cohomology. Like we have a first cohomology theory, like the first, uh, uh, the ones that he employs um, vector value differential form. And the other, we will see that employs uh, just differential forms on the manifold. Okay. So that's what uh, that's what we're gonna do. So those two objects are important, and uh, discussing these objects, there are some natural geometric questions which appear. Okay. So what is a Nienhuis pencil? Nienhuis pencil, similar to the uh, case of Poisson pencil, is a subspace subspace in uh, the space of um, uh, vector value differential forms, one forms, that is just operator fields, uh, such that if you, we restrict uh, the uh, frohlicher Nienhuis bracket onto this uh, subspace, then it is zero. The subspace itself can be fin finite dimensional or infinite dimensional. That is important. We will see that both cases are important. And uh, the restriction, again, we recall, recall that um, if we take two operators, then the frohlicher nienhuis bracket is not skew-symmetric, but symmetric, right? Because frohlicher nienhuis bracket is actually graded Lie algebra. So the restriction of, of this bracket onto this space, right? This is a strong thing. It in, it in particular implies, yes, that the space itself consists of Nienhuis operators only, right? If it was 
if the bracket was Q symmetric, then uh, P with P, uh, any element K from this uh, subspace P with itself would have been uh, zero. But in our case, it is symmetric. It is a Nienhuis torsion. We, re we remember that, that uh, the bracket of operator field with itself, it's Nienhuis torsion. So the restriction implies that we not only have Nien, uh, vanish, uh, implies that we have a uh, family of Nienhuis operators with the following property, if we take the linear combination of these uh, operator fields, then we get again an, uh, an inverse operator, right? Uh, so this uh, uh, definition, this is the second definition, which is more similar to the uh, B. Hamiltonian case. It's a case when you have several Poisson brackets. But there is an important difference here that we deal with an infinite dimensional pencils also. Usually in, um, uh, in case of B. Hamiltonian structure, you have two uh, brackets or some brackets, but usually the, there are, uh, the number of them is finite. Like you don't have infinite dimensional number of brackets. Especially like very large space functionally parameterized. Okay, so uh, the first example is rather simple. Well, if we uh, fix uh, coordinates and consider infinite dimensional subspace uh, cons uh, consisting of such operators, right? We just fix coordinates and we write them in, in, in coordinates. Obviously, uh, the, um, the family is parameterized by n functions of one variable. It is obvious that it is linear space if we uh, take a sum with, uh, when I say linear space, I usually, I mean linear space over the field. Uh, if the sum, I multiply them by numbers, it's okay. The, the set is closed, so it's a, uh, it's a vector field. Uh, important thing that it is an in inhuse pencil. How do we make it sure that this is an in inhuse pencil? Well, um, uh, we can take a sum of these two operators. Uh, the result will be an inhuse pencil. Uh, operator. We know that in here is operator diagonal, right? That's the um, we have discussed that actually follows from the classical theorems by Frolicher, uh, by Ninhuis and uh, himself and Heinzius. Uh, so uh, if we take the sum, it is Ninhuis operator, then we take each one, we subtract them, and we get the form of Frolicher Ninhuis bracket. We will see uh, this trick later, but this is important. So it is indeed a Frolicher, uh, it is an inhuis pencil, it means that uh, all the operators are compatible. And this uh, pencil is quite large because it is parameterized by n functions of single variable. Okay. Uh, we do have uh, an, another uh, trick up our sleeve that if we take uh, analytic functions, any analytic functions, uh, of the operator uh, and um, if we take operator L and then we take uh, each uh, analytic function and uh, well there's, there's a mistake here if you take two operators and you use analytic function of them then uh, their sum does not uh, Ah, no, it's, it's okay, yes, it is. The sum is again analytic function, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no mistake here. So we have a, a, we have a um, pencil which is parameterized by a single function, analytic function. Instead of analytic function, we can take any function which we want in a sense that uh, the result should be uh, carefully defined, like Margellian's theorem or something. The, the third example here is, it's a trivial one. I should have probably started with this one if you have uh, a collection of constant matrices, right? So you have n squared different operators. It's a finite dimensional uh, Poisson pencil. Obviously, uh, every element of this pencil is Nienhuis and the sum is Nienhuis, so it is a Nienhuis pencil. So, but 
we see that, uh, for example, if I take a constant knee in here's pencil, pencil, right, I can kind of uh, take only diagonal, for example, only diagonal matrices, and then I can add uh, other constant matrices. So, so the knee in here's pen pencils, they are, they have maximal elements by inclusion. What does it mean? It means they grow, 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 and um, element, uh, the Nintius pencil is called maximal. If uh, for any k uh, such that k commutes in with the, in the sense of Froehlicher Nintius bracket with all the elements of the pencil, then it implies that k lies in this pencil, right? So in particular, uh, uh, it implies that k must be Nintius, right? So because it lies in the pencil, and so on and so forth. So uh, th that's what uh, we are interested in, because when you deal with infinite, when you deal with an infinite dimensional case, like you deal with subalgebras or a regular algebra, for example, G, uh, regular matrix algebra, then the commutative subspaces uh, uh, you can't possibly classify all of them. There are only restrictions on their dimension, so it's it's a hopeless uh, hopeless problem. So the same thing goes here because we do not have um, because the dimension is infinite. So what we can hope for is we can uh, we do not even hope to classify all the maximal pencils. It's uh, we hope just to have to study this class of pencils because it seems natural and it is uh, simpler than studying all the pencils all together. Turns out that uh, the maximality is important property. It appears naturally in many uh, applications. It means that you do uh, deal with some pencil and then suddenly it you realize that it is maximal, that you cannot extend it, make it larger. So this is a very natural condition. It's, not na it's natural in the mathematical sense and in the sense of applications. So we start with a simple lemma. Okay, this lemma, it is, uh, it is a technical lemma, but I like it very much. I included the, it, le uh, this lemma into the lecture to illustrate an important, uh, important problem. Well, if you have uh, two, two Nienhuis operators, then you can take their multiplication, right? L times K. And uh, you may ask uh, whether uh, L times K is an inhuous operator, right? Because it seems natural because you can multiply operators and, and probably uh, it should be also an inhuous, right? But it turns out that uh, it does not necessarily need to be an inhuous, right? We, uh, at the same time, we know this, that we have this condition uh, of the vanishing of Froehlicher and Inhuis bracket when we have like the linear combination is also in Inhuis. So uh, when one asks if we have uh, some relation between these two conditions. We do not actually have this relation because if you, uh, if you recall, we had that, that huge, huge identity which relates three operators, they are different products like KLM and you have uh, KL, LM uh, and their products and it also relates their uh, Froehlicher and Inhuis brackets. We used this identity uh, when we proved the theorem about complex structure. This identity, it shows that it's, uh, uh, it's not true that if you have a uh, a, L, uh, L and K, you have their Froehlicher and Inhuis bracket vanishes, then uh, their, their product uh, also has vanishing Froehlicher and Inhuis bracket. It's, it's just not true. But it turns out that uh, for, for some special cases, for some special cases, right, uh, we do. Uh, it turns out that you do not need to multiply the operators, right? What you need to do, you need to do different operations. If L is an inhuous separator and K is an inhuous separator and they span the uh, Froehlicher and the Froehlicher inhuous bracket vanishes, then the following operators in inhuous C, these are two equivalent. Not LK and LK 
is in US, then they spend a pencil. But the you multiply by x in by k in minus one. See, so there's a relation uh, which goes like this. Well, uh, the proof proof is straightforward. It's it's not complicated. We take uh, the sum of uh, three tensors. First tensor is a simply an inverse tensor, and I take this tensor. It is tensor in L, and you see between L here, between L here and brackets, and between these two Ls, I add k in power minus one uh, k. See. So um, if I'll, I'll get rid of k's here, I get simply the formula for an inhaustion. That's I kind of deformed it, see? It is L, L eta, L xi eta, L xi, L eta, L squared xi eta. Okay, then I took the inhaustion uh, torsion for k and multiplied it by the following operator. This is exactly this operator squared, right? So I multiplied it and I see that this k minus one, it kills off uh, the k which stands in front of this bracket. So I get three here, three here, and I get four here, see? And um, that because, well, here I have k squared, uh, k minus one, k in power negative one, we'll see lk, and I have bracket like this. And then I'll take the Nihus bracket for this uh, operator together with a uh, substitution of the k inside the new distortion, which uh, uh, gives me this. See, it means that, well, if I'll take lk negative one and apply it to the k psi, then I'll get l psi, see? So I'll get this, I'll get this, and uh, here I have this, and this is I apply it inside and get l. So it's just simple trickery not 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 something something uh, complicated then I look I see that uh, uh, those f f I have uh, 12 12 terms out of these 12 terms four terms cancel out this this and this this I uh, uh, highlighted them by different color and I get the rest of, of uh, the formula and I'll take L k negative uh, in the power negative one out. And I see that uh, the rest of the formula is KL, KL, then we have LK, LK, they go with a sign plus, then we have negative uh, minus KL, LK, applied to the commutator, and then we have, uh, after I take this out, uh, we, get, we get negative L psi K eta, K psi L eta. This means that we have exactly the formula for the Frolicher Ninhuis bracket of these two operators. So after, because I took the Ninhuis operators, not, not like arbitrary operators, it means that this bracket vanishes because this is Ninhuis operator, L is Ninhuis operator, and K, and bracket for K vanishes. So I get the following formula, see? Uh, that means that uh, the Ninhuis torsion of this operator um, for the non-degenerate K uh, coincides with the following, following operator for the uh, Frolich and Nikhil's bracket. So they uh, vanish simultaneously, uh, if and only if, it means that if this operator, uh, if this operator is, this operator is Nikhil's, then this Frolich and Nikhil's bracket vanishes. So we see that we have uh, this formulation. We, again, we say two operators form a Poisson pencil if the Frolich and Nikhil's bracket vanishes or in, if they both are non-degenerate, which is can, which can always be done by adding the identity, right? Uh, if uh, L k minus one is in here, right? Uh, so this lemma is proved. So again, you take L k minus one, not L k, because one uh, for me, it, it, I think one should naturally expect that if lk is forming poison pencil if lk is in here, but it turns out that it's not right so it's it's one surprise here okay uh so this is important lemma now we can proceed to the maximum in here pencils we do not use this lemma actually i just again i told you uh i included it in for lecture for educational purposes so what we're going to do, we're going to try and calculate uh, the, we prove the following theorem. We say that, well, if we take diagonal 
uh, operator. It means that we have uh, those functions h we've uh, encountered earlier in our first example. If we'll take them just being linear functions, and then we take them being quadratic functions, and we consider uh, the following thing. We consider uh, uh, operators k, uh, which uh, commute with respect to froelich hernihus bracket with both L and L squared, right? If we we'll take them, we'll look at them, uh, then it turns out that k is diagonal and each, each uh, element on the diagonal depends on its own coordinates. So basically we say that in this case, k lies in this uh, pencil, right? So, uh, okay, so so we proceed with the calculation. First of all, this condition, LK vanishes, right? We have already calculated this condition because we calculated the uh, cohomologies of, the, of this operator, if you remember, in the previous lecture. And we did obtain the following formulas. We got that uh, what you do is you take your operator, you take a k, a k fun n functions of n, n variables, of all the variables, you write them on the diagonal, uh, use them as a kii, and then uh, you take uh, variables uh, and you can write, write all, the, all the other terms which are not on the diagonal, using these functions, right? So we say that if we look at the, uh, all the closed, uh, all, the, all the operators which uh, with vanishing for here in his bracket with L, then it, they are parameterized by N functions of N variables. And we later showed that uh, if we take the cohomology, then cohomology is trivial because it turns out that every such uh, operator can be expressed as a, uh, as a result of Lie derivative of the of our operator L, right? Because Lie derivative, because vector fields, they are also parameterized by n functions of n variables. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a strict, but we did it strict, right? So we have this formula, right? And uh, 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 we know that it holds. Now we need to calculate this one with a, with a square, right? So we just um, substitute it here. Uh, kind of the equality sign it didn't fit in, but doesn't matter. So I, I calculated, I get only four elements, right? Uh, inside, because if I'll take L uh, partial xi with the x with the partial xj, the ones, the other two, then it is zero, right? Because um, uh, the same thing is your your partial derivative. It is multiplied. Your partial vector field, base vector field, is multiplied by a function which depends on xi, right? And if you commute it with other uh, vector field, then it is zero. Okay, so uh, same thing here, but in, uh, after opening opening all the brackets, right? Uh, I'll I'll take uh, uh, this 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 and this. Here I have uh, x i squared. Have a, uh, here I have uh, x j squared. I get the following formula. Uh, I open them up. Uh, I open them. Open the brackets. Uh, gather the terms, and I get the following formula, right? So it's uh, there's some other terms but which I'm not actually interested in uh, because uh, I um, I do not uh, need to calculate the, all the all the terms. We will see it later. Okay. Um, so. Um, this must vanish, right? But uh, I do know that this condition holds, right? So I'll take this condition, which I already know, and substitute it here, right? So I, I see this, this, and uh, I'll get this. This is, a, uh, it goes like this. It means that it's KII, right? And uh, after the substitution, here it is IJ. See, I substitute here, I take this XJ minus XI, I'll take it out of this, uh, out of the bracket, then I get uh, xi plus x, xj plus xi minus 2xi is left. 
and I get the following formula. See, after I took uh, all the all the terms out, this is uh, this is what I get, and um, we see that uh, this 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 thing vanishes. It vanishes identically, which means that all the elements on the diagonal of our operator they do not depend on actual on all the variables. They depend only on its own variable, right? Because i does not is not equal to j. It's it's an assumption because operator uh, the in his bracket is skew symmetric, right? If you substitute x i and x x i, then you get zero. So it's always i is not equal to j. So this is vanish. Finally, I use this trick I've already mentioned earlier. I write it like this, and I get that all the diagonal elements, all the all the operators which are diagonal, uh, they all are inverse operators. And, uh, and now I get the following interesting thing. I see that, well, um, our pencil we have discussed, right? It coincides with the centralizer in a following sense. It means that if I'll take any element which commutes with these two, then it lies in this, in this set, right? And all the set uh, commutes with these elements. So when I found these two elements, it basically implies that the set is maximal, maximal because if I take any element which commutes with uh, all the pencil, it means it commutes with L and L squared. And by this theorem, it is supposed to be diagonal with uh, functions depending on its own variables. So it is maximum. Uh, now we proceed to the constant, um, to the constant pencil. Well, this, this next theorem, it was actually quite a surprise. Uh, when um, we discovered it, because uh, you, it seems it seems quite natural to assume that if you take all the constant matrices, they form a maximal pencil, right? It's, it's just it just sounds good, but well, even though if it's if it's not, if they do not form the pencil, then it seems like well the matrices which are form maximal pencil they they kind of look should look uh, like nice and here it is here it it's 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 not very nice actually well what is written here if you take it uh, if you take a look at the formula well you have a is a constant matrix right so each term each l each en entry of the l right it consists of a constant, which is element of a constant matrix A, and element from the matrix X, C transposed. Um, I do not write X and C as a columns, I write them as a rows, but they actually columns, right? I just save space in my lecture. So if you take one column and you multiply it by a column transposed, which is a row from the other side, you get actually a square matrix, right? Because it's kind of multiplication. And each component of this uh, matrix will be the multiplication uh, of the element from uh, column X with a number I and uh, from element from column C with a number J. So that's, that's the formula we get. Uh, the other important thing that this pencil, unlike the previous one, it is finite dimensional, right? Its dimensions is n squared plus n. And it turns out that it is maximal, maximal, uh, which is fun, which is fun. And we will see that it, we have a stronger, even stronger condition that it's not only maximal, but if we'll take all the constant matrices and we ask ourselves, what are the uh, Nienhuis operators that compute with all constant matrices with respect to Froelicher Nienhuis bracket, then we get exactly this pencil. See, so it is a centralizer, actually a centralizer for the constant matrices, which is surprising, which is surprising for me, uh, but still, still uh, quite interesting. And uh, we, we, we will prove it. We will see that it, it actually follows from the formulas. Uh, this is what I have discussed. I denote the second part, this part of the formula is B, A plus B. It's natural, and those are the components I, I, sh I told you. Those are a, uh, column X multiplied by row C, and we have a constant operator field a, a I G. Then uh, for I is not equal to J because again this is assumption is always because we deal with a skew symmetric tensor. Uh, we um, calculate the following. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Uh, just one second. 
Uh, here it is. Uh, yes. So uh, first, uh, first we need to ensure that actually what we have written here, that this formula, right, that those are in Hirsch operators. Okay. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, first we kind of calculate A and B, right? So because we, we this is actually a Poisson pencil, it means that if I'll have a, an element, uh, if I'll take A plus B and I calculate um, the Ninhoes operate Ninhoes vanishing of the Ninhoes torsion, then I'll get a bracket of A B and I get bracket of B B because bracket A A it vanishes. So that's what I do. I take the bracket A B and I just calculate it. So I substitute uh, the vector field like this. See, and I get the following formula. This is this is what I get. See, this is basically an o o vector field which with entries. Each entry depends on its own coordinates, multiplied by some constant c i. This constant is the same for 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 the entire for the entire vector field. And uh, the, I apply it here, and then I I apply it to, uh, here. And um, now now I open open the bracket right. And I get uh, the following. I see that I'll take the constant out, right? Here should be alpha, I'm sorry, it's a bit beta. So I'll take the constant out and I get the following formula, see? So I'll get all the terms in Excel and I get that here so I have CI minus CJ, okay? Then I have CJ, here it is, with a different sign and I have minus CI. So all they they all cancel out. So, so it turns out that uh, those two operator fields they commute with respect to the flow of Nihus break. Now and now I can see that the Nihus torsion written is a flow of Nihus break for the operator P. Right? Uh, I I wrote one half to avoid writing two here because if we remember the flow of Nihus break it it is actually two of operator with itself. Two Ninhus uh, tensors, two Ninhus torsions. So I substitute, and that's what I get. See, I get these formulas. Well, if I look at this uh, bracket first, I see that it is zero. Why? Because this is a vector field and this vector field they coincide and they just differ by multiplication of the constant. So I can take the constant out, and I get the commutator vector field with itself. So because of skew symmetry, it is zero. Here it's a little bit more complicated. I take ci out and then I differentiate it. But this sum is differentiating is in xj yields a partial xj, right? Because all the others vanish. And after I take xj, I apply b to it and I get cj. And I get the same formula. And because of this symmetry, I get ci cj here and cj ci here. And they vanish. And so b itself is a in his operator. So uh, uh, this automatically applies that we deal with a in his, um, pencil, that all the all the operators are in his. Why? Because we'll take this for some and uh, we open it. Uh, as I said, A with A is zero. Uh, after all the all, all the calculations, we get that they vanish. And that's, then we have a, a Ninhuis pencil. Now, we, what we want to do is we want to prove that this pencil is maximal. This is a trick we're going to use a lot, and this is what we already did. This trick is simple. We need to find a set, a collection, maybe a smaller pencil, for which or bigger pencil, for which uh, the one pencil we study is actually a centralizer. See. And uh, in in previous case, we took L L squared. We took like two dimensional pairs with pencil, which is uh, spanned by two operators. And here, what we do, we take uh, uh, a space of constant operators. That's what I, I was I was talking about. So uh, the constant operators they are spanned like linear space with a uh, matrix identities. What is matrix identity? Matrix identities is an element which has all the entries except one zero, right? And non-zero element is, is usually something on the um, ith row and the uh, jth column, column number j. 
And this is what we write here. This is tensor product. This is like a simple way, standard way of writing tensors of type one one. We've already used it in previous lecture. Tensor fields we have a constant tensor fields of the following form, right? How it acts on the uh, on the uh, vector fields? Uh, well, if you take a and you apply any vector field, if k is not equal to j, then you get zero. That is what we write using Kronecker delta symbol. And if you get k equals to j, then you get uh, partial xi. You get i. -th you get the basis vector field of number number i. Okay, that's what you do. So this is how this operator works. This is exactly the condition. And this is a good thing to use in the formula. Okay, so they use all the matrices now, but for now, for, for just uh, this moment, we think that i and j are fixed. We will, Later, uh, we what we do, we fix i and j, we calculate the formula, and then we look at the i and j and see how they give us different conditions. So I apply two basis vector fields, x, k, and x, s. See, I don't know, maybe x, s coincides with uh, s equals to j or i. There's no assumptions like this or not equal. I just do the calculation. So I open the brackets because this matrix is constant. I have only four terms. They look like this. I take the chronic or delta. I can take it out of the bracket because it's constant. And after opening all the brackets, I get the following formula. Look, so I get this one, multi, uh, this formula. You have a partial xi, xi, and you have partial x alpha, x alpha. Here you have a summation in alpha. So uh, I look at this tensor condition carefully. And uh, because I know that it, it vanishes, I can write the tensor condition in terms of uh, coefficients. Um, in terms of coefficients k, I get the following system of equation. I, I just uh, kind of take this uh, and take a partial xi out of this summation, right? Uh, of both this summation. And uh, and I get, uh, I get the following formula. No, no, I didn't write the form. I'm sorry. So uh, uh, I didn't take anything out of summation. So I just uh, look at this formula. Okay, assume that K and S is uh, not coincides with any I and J. So they, they, we have a I, J, K, S, four elements. They all are different. It means the dimension is at least four, but doesn't matter. Okay, they all are different. What can we say? Well, it means that those chronic deltas, they vanish and we get the following condition. We have that the partial of this S in K equals to partial of this K, J, K in, uh, in S. Well, it's a good condition, but we do not need it. This condition will follow from the other conditions. It turns out that you do not need these conditions. You start with them. You need to take K equals to J. K equals to J for this chronic delta to be one. If you take K equals to J, it means that here you have J, here you have J, uh, here you have J, and uh, you take this sum and you split it in two, right? As we did before, and this again vanishes because if K equals to J, then S cannot be equals, equal to J because this is a skew-symmetric tensor. Then if this chronic delta is one, then this chronic delta is necessary zero. So it means that I have these three terms. Uh, I write these three terms, again, splitting them, right? So I take these first three. Uh, they give me the formula like this. This is for xi. And then I'll take the summation uh, with alpha not being equals to i, because I took, took uh, i from this, so the summation, and kind of written it separately. What do I see? I see, well, um, we see that, what does this condition hold? In K, the alpha stands for the number of the row, right? So if we look at the, at the row, right? And we know that S and I, right? Uh, they they uh, may uh, coincide. The only thing that does not uh, coincide is alpha. So I say uh, that this condition implies that uh, all the rows except the row number i 
does not depend on xi, right? Because this this vanishes. This formula, uh, this is zero. Okay, uh, and if because we took again we uh, fixed i and j in the beginning, but now we can vary them, then we get that in the entire matrix, all the rows, all the rows, they're like this. So uh, the only thing uh, we know is that each row depends on its own coordinate, right? So elements in first row, they depend on x1, elements in the second row depend on x2, and etc. It comes from this condition. Now we look at this condition. Okay, uh, if, if we know that the rows, they depend on only on its own coordinates, then um, the, in case, S uh, is not is not i or j, right? Because we know that S is not j. S might, might be i, and uh, uh, because of S is not j, then this uh, thing vanishes. That that middle term because it's it's an element from the i row. And I uh, take the derivative in xs, and we define that again. The rows they depend on its own coordinates, so this vanishes. So I get this sum, and this yields me this condition, right? And what is this condition? It says, well, look, uh, if I take the row number j differentiated in j, then I get the same function. In if I take the uh, column number s, and I differentiate uh, the i th the element from row number i in i. This is a function of j, this is a function of i. They coincide identically because the bracket vanishes, uh, for has bracket vanishes identically. It means that they're both uh, constants, right? Because they cannot be anything else. If, uh, if I'll take the derivative of uh, this in xj, uh, then this vanishes, right? And I get that the second derivative equals to zero, which again implies that the first derivative is constant. Okay, so they're both constants, first of all, and the second, the, those constants are the same, are the same for the entire column. So we get the following, following construction. We have a row of the matrix, each row depends on its own coordinates, and uh, each column, each column, it looks like this. It's, it's some constant which multiplied in first row, it is multiplied by x1, in second row it is multiplied by x2, Etc. 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 This is exactly after we take this constant, we name them as C's, right? C1, C2, etc. And we get this for this exactly this formula. So K, right? And because we integrate this, right, we have all the conditions on the K. So when we integrate that, we have also constant terms, uh, they naturally appear. So basically, we have shown that if I'll take the uh, matrix unity, the element which has uh, one in one place, uh, and I'll take uh, uh, all these elements, and I'll take all the brackets, and uh, they all vanish, then I get that k must look like this, see? It is linear in x, and it's very specifically linear. Uh, and what we get, we get that uh, we have just shown that if we take all the constant matrices and we take their centralizer in a sense of, in a sense of Froelich and Inhus bracket, then it coincides with this uh, pencil we have dis, uh, discovered, uh, uh, we have described, and we know that all the constant, uh, uh, all the constant matrices, they also lie in this pencil, right? So. Uh, the centralizer, of the, because this is the, the, we started with a, a Nihus pencil, so we get that uh, this this uh, space is maximum maximal space. Why? Because if some element commutes with the entire um, centralizer, then it commutes with the all elements, with the all constant matrices, and then in particular it must lie in this centralizer. And we have shown that the centralizer is commutative, right? Which is again very surprising. This is a different operation. It's not a, um, because well, if you deal with the Lie algebras, then uh, the centralizers of regular elements they vary. They all, all the time they are commutative. That's the, that's the nature of the Lie algebra. But in our case, the centralizer, uh, the centralizer in the adjoint sense. But here we have that. This thing, it kind of commutes uh, with respect to the different bracket, which is symmetric, not skew symmetric, again. So we have shown that this is a maximal pencil, and we've shown uh, that this is actually centralizer of all the constant matrices. Again, 
take a look at this pencil. It looks it looks interesting, a little bit ugly, I think, but uh, very 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 interesting result on its own. Okay, now um, what we got so far? We introduced the Poisson piece, uh, the Nihai's pencils, and. And we discussed that those pencils can be infinite and both finite and both infinite dimension. Okay, and uh, maximal pencils. And we constant operated then form a maximal pencil. Quite surprising for me. Again, maybe not for you. Okay. Now uh, the next theorem it deals with uh, with another pencil. This pencil naturally appears in the integrable systems of hydrodynamic type. Um, those are partial differential equations uh, with a very specific Poisson bracket, variational Poisson bracket, and it turns out that uh, such such operators uh, they naturally appear in case you have compatible Poisson brackets of this type. Um, this. This matrix is symmetric, which is which is important thing for us, and this is the condition uh, we are looking for. Mm, this the uh, the operators which are symmetric, which means that they are adjoint with respect to some. <clears throat> because you know, if you change coordinates, the symmetric matrix does not uh, may not become symmetric. But the important thing is that these operators they are joined with respect to some. Mm, uh, some scalar products, some Riemann metric, right? Uh, diagonal or even flat, right? But what is important that they are, mm, are joined with respect to this bracket, and, and they generate and they form a they naturally appear and form a maximal pencil. So. Uh, how do we prove that? And again, uh, uh, again, I need to c comment on the formulas. I'm sorry that A is a symmetric matrix uh, with constant entries. X, B, T, B, X, T. This is the same we just discussed. It's a two column, column and row. You multiply the column by the row on the right. And this, this, the last part is you take X column, right? And you multiply it by X uh, transposed and you get uh, quadratic terms, but they are quite nice. It means that you have a quadratic matrix, which with entries uh, in the place I, with number i and j, they are just multiplication of x i x j, and the k's are just constant. It is it plays an important role if we you take um, a joint matrix, if you take a constant uh, constant um, uh, Riemann metric in these coordinates and you apply uh, with 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 respect to what this operator itself a joint. And you apply this operator, then it turns out that the result will be a matrix of constant sectional curvature, and the constant sectional curvature will be exactly k. That's the name. Um, now I'm thinking that it's quite confusing because I use the k for the term for, for for the matrices, but well, okay, this is a different k. So uh, now we need to prove that this uh, this pencil. It's a Poisson pencil and it is maximal. Well, uh, we start uh, with a different direction. Okay, we first we uh, first we solve seemingly un, un, uh, seemingly not so related problem. We take uh, the Nihus pencil of constant symmetric matrices. We just uh, calculated. Uh, we just studied the pencil of all the constant matrices, right? And now we make it smaller. We take all the constant symmetric matrices. Okay, look at them and consider their centralizer. We 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 are interested in the following question: Which um, Nihio separator commute with all symmetric constant matrices? With all symmetric constant matrices. Uh, uh, okay, uh, we start with a uh, again with a recollecting of the calculations we did earlier doing the cohomology. Uh, if we have um, symmetric operator, uh, symmetric operators, they contain uh, diagonal operators with uh, uh, pairwise distinct eigenvalues, right? So uh, lambda 1, uh, etc., lambda n, the pairwise distinct constant eigenvalues. And as we 
described this uh, we have discussed it we know uh, how uh, the the condition looks like right it looks like this it means that you have uh, you have diagonal elements there arbitrary and you have uh, those uh, elements uh, above the diagonal they are related by this condition if you remember you we when we calculate the um, this condition we discussed that you can kill off all the k's using the uh, no, not the curtain change but because uh, the the operators with the zeros on diagonal they exact right exact in the sense of roll here his cohomology so i'll take this operator and look at this and but i i need to look at this condition because well my lambda they're not fixed right they vary from i can I'll, I, this this should hold for all the possible lambdas right but if this condition holds for all the possible lambdas right for all the possible lambdas then automatically uh, i'm sorry this this is should be not alpha but lambda lambda then for all the triples all the triples i get that each of this is zero right because well i get different lambdas they vary them and i get that all of them are zero important thing is that uh, when we write this condition then uh, alpha is not is not equal to i and is not equal to j and i itself is not equal to j so we do have a triple we have a triple of uh, pairwise distinct elements right pairwise distinct elements uh, thus uh, automatically from this condition we get that um, that each element uh, k alpha j right it uh, because all all these derivatives vanish for alpha not equal to i not equal to j we uh, get right that each each uh, element each element and uh, or when we calculated um, again the cohomology we got that element Elements on the diagonal they depend only on their own coordinates that that another important feature and here we get that all the elements that are not on the diagonal they depend on two actually coordinates right because all the derivative all the uh, pairwise distinct derivative vanish because i is not uh, j is not i j is not alpha that means that k alpha i depends on x alpha x i okay if it depends on x alpha x i uh, it means that we have a, a matrix that this ha has a very specific dependence on coordinates. But now, what we're going to do? We take uh, we take constant matrix in the following form. This is um, constant operators that uh, generate, uh, which form the the operator I used before because i calculated them earlier when we calculate the centralizer or the constant matrices i just uh, i can skip the calculation and write the formula because i need to write the formula for for this condition then i, I need to switch j and i and i get the for uh, the second part of the formula so this is how the formula looks here is summation chronic delta we've just encountered today and here we have chronicle dealt with j, and here we have chronicle dealt with i. And, and so if i, j, k, s pairwise distinct, then this formula is zero, right? It is surprising. Why? Because it turns out that this condition is enough for this formula to vanish. Okay, look, if uh, j, s, if k, it's not k not equal to this to this, then it is zero. If s not equal to this to this, this, this is zero. If phi is not equal to this to this it is zero but it might be not zero but because the chronic delta k is not equal to j then it is zero s is not equal to j then it is the entire is zero so all the four all the eight terms they vanish right so uh it all the conditions all the extra conditions we're interested in they actually lie in a case when some of the vector fields they coincide with a with a, some of some of the indices they coincide and first we take 
the following k equals j and s uh, is not i is not equal to i then if um, k equals j then we get j j and we know that if k is equals j then s is not j and we get here we get diagonal element which we uh, take the derivative of in recording with the number s which is not j and we know that it depends on j so it vanishes okay now if uh, uh, k is equal j then this derivative does not necessarily vanish it gives us the first condition then if i'll take uh, k equals to j right it means that k is not cannot be equal to y and because s is not i then all the other chronicle deltas except this one they vanish and here as as if s is not i s is not k because k is j right uh, s cannot be j uh, so i get this zero and i get this zero okay so uh it means that i get this and this two terms and i get the following condition what does it say well again look at this condition closely it says well if you take the row number j and you differentiate it in j and uh, you get a function of two variables of variable xs and variable xj basically then you take the row number i and differentiate it i then you get a, a function of xi and xs and they coincide well they coincide only in one case when um, uh, they both both these formulas they do not depend this one does not depend on xj this does not depend on xi because i can differentiate them and get like this so i get the collection of functions see in previous case earlier when we used all the constant uh, operators uh, we got that here it should be function here right uh, no not function but constant here we got uh, constant c but here it's not constant it's a fun function of xs so uh, because <clears throat> this formula holds i get that um, this is how how our matrix looks like after we looked at these conditions well it looks like this <clears throat> i'm sorry it looks like a multiplication of x with a row consisting of a, s and functions functions of single variable okay okay this is how k looks like okay we apply um uh, extra condition the last one we've we've seen that this holds uh, automatically from from the, this one we've seen that this yields us the following and now we, so we take k equals j and s equals i and we look at this if k <clears throat> equals j and s equals i then this vanishes s equals i and k equals j this does not uh necessary uh s sorry s equals to i and k equals to j right it, this does not vanish but because k equals to j s equals to i then i get that for alpha equals to j this minus this gives us zero and same goes here uh four 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 uh k equals j i think i think uh for this one okay and this this and this those two vanish so we have this summation in alpha uh, those two and we uh some of these of terms from this summation they were killed off by these terms so actually after we substitute uh, all the brackets we get the following formula see we get all the summation because those terms killed off uh, the ones with the number i and number j we get the following formula see so we get this partial uh, j and j uh, i'm sorry this is, should be i and i this is a typo here i think yes i equals to s yes it should be it should be i here it is i equals to s uh, with a negative sign because otherwise it's it's identically zero i'm sorry this is a typo he's supposed to be jj i i so if we look at jj i i and we differentiate them uh, uh we get that the following uh formula holds see because we've already we already know this right uh we 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 get that this this function is in, in lower 
in uh, lower coordinates and in upper coordinates. And it, we take here it is x alpha and here it is x alpha multiplied by function with a number j, it's multiplied by function number number i, and they derived in their own coordinates, right? And this is what we get. We see that though if j depends on xj, if i depends on xy, and this identity, it gives us, well, uh, the same thing here. It means that uh, th those two functions are constant because left side depends on xj, right depends on xi, so they both are constant. So if they are constant, they constant, they derivatives constant, they, they, they are itself uh, linear functions, right? And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I think here should be, sh I forgot when I wrote this, uh, this basically constant here, constant plus, plus, plus this. And uh, after, yeah, uh, constant plus, plus this. Uh, yes, yes, it should be constant here. Well, after I integrate all the formulas, I get the following formula, see? No, I, I, because of the, all the restrictions like this, we get those the constants, they coincide and this constant is like this. So we have shown that the centralizer, the centralizer of the, all the um, symmetric matrices, it looks like this, all the symmetric operators is local. Well, uh, bad news, bad news that these, these, these matrices, they do not all compute. Yes, so if, if I'll take all these matrices and I restrict the Folkin-Nichus bracket on this linear space, which is finite dimensional, you can see that the first one is n, uh, n times n plus 1 over 2 dimensions. These two yields two n dimensions, and this one yields uh, dimension 1 because k is a single single uh, terms here, here again see uh, it is confusing because this k and this k they look the same it's not not, not the same it's it's different constant uh, so uh, we can we to to use the same trick we need to expand uh, the collection of, of the matrices we, we, we are working with right it's not enough to use only symmetric constant and that's what we're going to do we take elements called the B, B element, uh, element B, it's like this, right? This is like the one which spans here. First of all, let us ensure that this is an inhuse operator because uh, what we want to get is we want to get the Poisson pencil, we need an inhuse operator, and we need for, for this pencil to be uh, an inhuse pencil, right? Because we, we are interested in centralized inhuse pencil. Okay, we know that those two, they, uh, their for inhuse bracket vanishes because uh, for a equals to zero c and b equals to zero this is the element from the centralizer so the only thing i need to calculate is a b with itself bracket of b with itself so this is what i do i calculate b bracket with itself and i get uh, something like this c this is xi multiplied by this if uh, th this is a typo here it should be uh, underlined so it should be lower and if i differentiate it in xj, right? So I differentiate it, I get xj, and after I apply b, b, I get xi, xj, and again this vector. Form. And after I do this, this, and those two, I get the following formula. So they, it is indeed an in inhuse operator. It is indeed an in inhuse operator. Okay, so. So for, if k is not zero, we can uh, rewrite the L as follows. See what's, what we do is just, um, uh, the, this is the, this is the, the not, not, not this space, but the space of L, that's one uh, we've, we're trying to prove the maximality. So after we know that uh, the constants commute, the um, this square, uh, this quadratic in coordinates operator commutes. Uh, the only thing we need is just we need to to make sure that this this the Nijhuis tensor of uh, this operator bench. Actually, if we'd have been, we could have started with this, like make all the calculations 
straight ahead. But the, the way we uh, acted, we kind of shorted uh, our way a little bit because, well, now we're going to do, we're going to do the following trick. Look, we take um, X and uh, we take B and we write the operator like this. Now it is a constant part and this quadratic part. And this operator and this operator, they're related by a coordinate change, by the shift, right? So I can name this one, uh, for example, X bar and this one X bar, and I'll get that uh, because this is a coordinate shift, then the Jacobi matrix is identical. And it means that operator, it just shifts, right? And because operator shifts, it means that, well, uh, this, this operator, it becomes just constant part K bar X bar X transposed. And we've already showed that this operator is in here. So it means that the, this operator is in here, right? By, so it's, it's a good trick which allows to, for us to short some calculations. Okay, that's what we did. Now we take the following operator. This operator, it's actually, well, if you look at this operator, it can be understood as difference between this, like if you subtract one from another and this. Because if you take B and this, you take C minus B, right? and you denote the constant collection P and you get like this, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show that uh, the, these, these uh, uh, elements, they are exactly the centralizer of this Ninhuis pencil S bar, which is again consists of symmetric matrices and quadratic operator. So how do we do that? We calculate, we do the straight ahead calculation and it is a little bit messy. It is a little uh, bit complicated because there is no shortcuts here, but it is still nice. So we subtract, uh, substitute, open all the, open all the brackets, do all the calculations, uh, open the brackets like this, apply C, which is like this, and we get the following summation and the result is like this, see? we get that this thing vanishes if and only if pi and p all the pi's they are zero because here we actually have this vector field is not zero right and uh, i'm sorry this vector field is not zero but this uh, these coefficients these coefficients right they depend on xi and xj right and they identically vanish because there's a, there's a, these coefficients, coefficients are polynomial. It means that all the coefficient, all the coefficients must vanish, right? And we see because of i and j are fixed, we take different i's and j, and I get to all that uh, all those p i's and p j's must vanish. So that's what we have shown. Now we get all the results. We consider the uh, centralizer of S. We get the description. It goes like this. Now, uh, we know that uh, we extend ele uh, element B and uh, we want to study the centralizer of C a bar, which contains S, S bar. And we ask if oh, these are the centralizer of S, I need to take only those matrices that commute with the B, right? And I'll take all these elements and I have already did all the calculations uh, before. And I get that those are in the form uh, like this. This is exactly this form right uh, because as i said as i told you these ones they commute with b we've already discussed this and this difference uh, does not commute with b it commutes only if it is zero and because i'll take this subtract this and get that the only ones that commute are like this so it means that if i'll take constant symmetric matrices and i add this quadratic matrix and take the centralized it coincides with the pencil we've discussed and this entire thing this entire space is a it is pencil right the restriction of frolic and in his bracket on it is zero so we have shown that this is pencil this pencil is also uh, maximal we see that it's again a finite dimensional pencil but the uh, uh, it, it is pretty nice and gives you uh, a good example of quadratic Ninhuis operators, right? It's, it's a nice thing to know a quadratic Ninhuis operator because we've already know the linear Ninhuis operators. They come from, if you remember, from the left symmetric algebras. And now you know a quadratic Ninhuis operator. So if, I, if uh, anyone asks, uh, do you know any quadratic Ninhuis operator? You can write this one straight ahead. Uh, okay.
So um, that's it uh, for Ninhuis pencils. That is for, for Ninhuis pencils. Uh, again, there are a lot of a lot of open problems and a lot of questions, uh, but uh, they, they they'll be discussed. The open problems they will be discussed later in our uh, final lectures. Uh, so here, uh, what 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 we need to do is we need to to sum these things up. Is that we need to look at the second cohomology okay the first cohomology we've discussed was a frolicking in his cohomology it is important we've understood that this cohomology is also important it it, it actually appeared appeared in um, in study of uh, integrable systems in a sense that People were asking like basic questions about uh, you have an operator when Ninhuis operator when it has a, a nice uh, nice normal form, and so that if you study the second companion form, then you bump into this uh, into this second cohomology. Usually, it is written on its own, like you have a Ninhuis operator and you do not uh, use all this. Probably here an in here is bracket formalism. You just use uh, straight ahead approach. But here we have an advantage. We already know all the formalism around here. Yes, so we can kind of do a really nice thing and uh, discuss this cohomology in a sh in a short. So first. Uh, uh, we know that for the Hughes cohomology, it is divided, it is defined on the vector value differential forms, right? Okay, and it's defined like this. Uh, recall that we have a Lie derivative along the vector value differential form, and this Lie derivative is defined as a bracket, is a graded bracket of the graded derivations. You take uh, uh, inner derivative with respect to this uh, vector value differential form, and you take this graded bracket with a differential, right? Differential uh, uh, is a derivation, is a graded derivation of degree one. It increases degree by one. Uh, the, the, the derivation, the Lie derivation along operator field, operator field, right? Uh, uh, the substitution, the substitution. I'm sorry, the inner derivation along along vector field is the derivation of degree zero, right? The derivation uh, along inner derivation along vector field, it's the, the derivation of negative of degree negative one, and along operator field, it is a derivation of degree zero. So the graded commut commutator, the graded commutator, it's it is like this because here you have minus minus times minus one in the power, uh, the degree of first derivation and times the degree of second derivation. In our case, it's one and zero, so it's a, it's a minus. So we get, we get that we have a Lie, a Lie derivative along the operator field. It's, it's defined like this. Now, uh, because uh, this is the derivation of degree zero and this is derivation of degree one, we get that the Lie derivation along L is a derivation of degree uh, one. Uh, so we get an, uh, an interesting operation which increases the degree of differential forms. Okay, so it turns out that it is this derivation being squared is zero, which is fun, right? And it defines the second cohomology and not, not the second in the sense that second group, but another cohomology. And uh, uh, again, we use carefully terms because uh, in literature there are different names for these cohomologies. So we just say another cohomology, okay? So we need to prove this. It is quite simple. The proof is quite simple and straightforward if, you, if we know all the, all the Froelich and Nihuis formulas. First of all, we know that uh, uh, the derivative along L is a derivation, is a derivation, graded derivation, which means, and we know that the differential forms, they're generated by one forms and they're generated by functions. Moreover, if, if we talk a very specifically, they are generated, they are generated by functions and exact one forms, right? Exact one forms. 
so let's first take a look at L squared applied to a function. Okay, so if we apply uh, the lead derivative along L to F one time, one time, then we get this, right? So it, 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 it is, it, it is uh, rather simple. So we get this. Okay, you say fine. It's, it means it, it took the, the differential of f and I uh, applied L, L, L star to it. It means if I apply it to any um, vector field, then L will go, go, go inside. Okay. Uh, now, I'll take a look at this one and apply this formula. And I just write this. See, it goes like this. Simple formula. Uh, it's not obvious that it is zero, but now let's carefully look at how this um, uh, differential form on the right hand side of the formula, it acts on two vector fields. I just plug into vector fields. Okay, uh, it goes like this. First of all, I need to take this differential. It, 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 it will be a two form, right? And I need to substitute uh, operator field LN. If you remember the formula, it goes like this. You take the sum and you substitute uh, into the first argument and then it's into the second argument. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I substitute in first argument and second argument and I go it, and I get the following, see? Uh, it means that I took, uh, I took this, uh, uh, I forgot uh, D here, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be D here. So I took this and substituted the first one and I substituted the second one. And uh, now uh, I'll take this, this, the second one and apply D and take, this means at applying the operator, it gives you a square of the operator and apply it to differential. And I apply this differential and I get that uh, the following formula is zero. Why? Because this is exactly the new distortion, the formula from the second lecture. It also has a second, usually second uh, uh, D, uh, D applied to the one form, but if we apply D to our one form, then then uh, then we get zero, right? Because uh, in our case, it is uh, exact form. So we get zero. So this is exactly, it is, it is exactly the vanishing of the inhaust torsion. So if L has vanishing in inhaust torsion, then, L squared on functions gives us zero. Now, we know that L commutes with D. This is the part of uh, the theorem we've discussed in, uh, two, in, in, in lecture number 16, in lecture number 16. And if they commute, then it, it, it because uh, this is uh, the thing of degree one, and this is this thing of degree also one, then this this formula is uh, I think wrong because it should be zero here. It's typo. I'm sorry, but it doesn't matter. It means that it's plus minus. So if I apply this uh, thing to d, it means that I can take d out, which means if I applied it uh, the lead derivative again the second time, then I'll get a lead derivative here and d I took out and I'll get zero. So it means that. Lee derivative squared along the operator field uh, of Ninhurst, of along Ninhurst operator fields, it is uh, vanishes on exact forms, right? So it vanishes on all the functions and on all the exact forms. It means that it vanishes on all the one forms and it means that it vanishes on all the forms. So it means because of the graded derivation property, we have that L, uh, this Lee derivative squared it is zero. Okay, so uh, and this this uh, Lee, uh, Lee derivative uh, defines the second uh, cohomology uh, for uh, Ninhurst operator L. And this cohomology it lives on the differential forms, right? It uh, transforms the differential forms. If I'll take L to be identity, then uh, I can calculate the formulas, uh, all the formulas, and they give me that the uh, the lead derivative along identity is just simply the regular exterior derivative. Why? Because if applied to function, 
right? I'll, you'll just go over this, right? Uh, look at this formula. It means that it's just derivative, right? And if it's just derivative, then this is just a square derivative, right? And it means that uh, your mm, graded derivation, it acts as a uh, exterior derivative on functions and one form, on closed one forms. And thus, because of the uh, graded property, it acts on the entire space of uh, one forms uh, same way. Right, so it's just a derivation, exterior derivation. So uh, we can think of uh, this cohomology is a perturbation of the regular cohomology because that's what you do. You, because you know that if L is an inverse, then identity plus L is an inverse, and you can write identity plus lambda L, and you get this perturbation, and you get this new differential, exterior differential on the regular differential forms, and these. Mm, perturbation is uh, the one right that uh, yields you the these uh, cohomology things. Uh, we call it mean Hughes cohomology very carefully again, and uh, in the end we get the following uh, condition like this. This condition is that. Um, this is the conservation laws. See, it turns out that to deal with the conservation laws, you need to take this take this differential, and uh, you need to take the regular differential. So it's kind of composition of two uh, differentials. It turns out that, well, if you take a composition of these two differential, because they commute with a negative sign here again, because of the purple, uh, uh, because they anti-commute or whatever, uh, it means that if I'll take them squared, that uh, again, I get zero. So I have this, this very specific, uh, very interesting uh, sub cohomologies when I take two, when I skip over the one, I'll take zero forms and get to the two forms, and uh, the cohomology is like, and the formula is like this. They appear in uh, uh, different different contexts. So um, that's it. There are exercises in the uh, in the end. Well. Uh, the first one is to prove this uh, that this pencil is maximal dimension two. If you recall, there, there was an um, assumption that M is at least three when we proved it. Because we, it, if you re remember then that the uh, uh, conditions we derived from the formulas, right, they required for us to have three, at least three different indices, right? It's not the case when the dimension is two, you have only two indices. So you do not have this, uh, th this number of conditions, but it's still, it's still uh, can be done, and this pencil is still um, uh, constant. It's just the, um, the thing that breaks, which doesn't work in dimension two, is that the centralizer of constant matrices, it's not finite dimensional, which is quite a surprise, actually, what was for me. It becomes infinite dimensional in dimension two, which is, again, uh, it means that you have this, this form you we've already mentioned, and you have extra functional uh, functional freedom. You have uh, you can add functional freedom is actually a function of two variables. But if uh, the dimension uh, and but this this functional freedom it does not change the case that if you add those quadratic elements that uh, the result will still be uh, uh, well. You get a large a large space, but it's it's not commutative, right? Uh, so it's again you get to the point where this 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 is a Poisson pencil, which is an interesting case itself. Well, uh, simple observation: make sure that if you look at the first mean Hirsch cohomology with the number zero, and L is non-degenerate, then it's just the Durham cohomology. Uh, and uh, you can calculate the cohomology, Nienhuis cohomology, first cohomology for diagonal Nienhuis operator with constant pairwise distinct angular values. Because if you look at those cohomologies, you will see that 
those of those formulas are similar to the formulas we used in calculating Fraunhofer integer of cohomology. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think there is a deep connection which lies here, which is again needs to be discovered. We do not know yet this connection, but uh, but I guess it is here, and it should be rather interesting to find the relation between these two cohomology because of course uh, you have single operator uh, field it defines two different cohomologies and two different spaces and the natural question is how they these cohomologies are related and what what uh, things each cohomology represents okay that's it thank you any questions Okay, thank you very much.